Cornwall. It is so good to be with you. Just want to give a shout out to everybody online on Zoom. Uh, I can't see you because I'm staring right at my camera, but I am so glad you're with us. So if you are visiting us from I don't know where, Long Salt, uh, visiting us from North Stormont, visiting us from Peterborough or Waterloo or Ottawa or right here in the metropolis of Cornwall. Good morning. It's good to be with you. So glad that we could meet together today. And uh, like Pastor Ingrid said, we are starting a new series. We are in a big series all year that is helping us to, like the big screen, the big board behind me, look more like Jesus. And just just to uh, take that and uh, make it like our ethos for this year. How do we uh, see our lives look more like Jesus? And now in this series, we're going to be looking at loving more like Jesus. How we we all are uh, designed for love and can uh, express love. If we're honest, there's a marked difference between what our love can look like and what the love of Jesus can look like. And so we just want to unpack that, look at that, uh, look at some Old Testament characters and some New Testament characters, some things that we can see in the whole spectrum of what God's Word has for us in order to unpack what it would look like to allow God's love to reign supreme in our lives and God's love to be flowing through us in our lives. And so today we're going to jump into that, and we're going to look at uh, two characters, or two, one, like I said, one scenario from the Old Testament, one scenario from the New Testament, that really epitomizes and looks at uh, loving God and loving others uh, the way that we should and the way we want to. So let's dive in. My question for you this morning is, have you ever run towards something uh, and thought it was going to be amazing. And, you, and the reason why you could run towards it is because you had this anticipation and expectation that it was going to be awesome. And as you were running towards it, all of a sudden you ended up needing to run in the opposite direction because you realized what you were running to wasn't quite what you expected. Now, I think you could probably, depending on your age and stage or how you remember things in life, you can remember a few scenarios maybe like this. Going to the ocean or going to uh, the Lake Ontario or wherever, and the big waves crashing in on the beach, and they look so inviting and exciting, and you like put off your flip-flops and you start running towards the waves, and then you realize how big those waves are. And the first one hits you and knocks you on your, on your backside, and then you know what you're doing is you're turning around and you're running away from the waves. And if you've never done that, I'm sure you've seen children doing that, where they run towards the waves, realize that the wave is probably their height or taller, and then you see the look on their face as they're running back from the waves towards you on the beach, and their eyes are just like, that's going to knock me over. Or maybe, maybe this, you see that cute little dog, that cute little dog that looks like it can just fit in your purse, and it just looks like it wants to be loved and, and adored and, and cuddled and everything like that, and you see it, and you're just like, oh! And you want to reach down and you put out your hand to, to, to pet it. And all of a sudden, that little cute dog's teeth show up. And it's like, ah, 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 ah. and you're just like, oh, my goodness. And you're moving in the exact opposite direction of that cute little dog that turned out to be really vicious, right? Or maybe, maybe like my, my beautiful wife experienced, uh, going to the CN Tower and being able to stand on the thick glass floor that you can look down the CN Tower and realize in that moment that a clear glass floor and your equilibrium do not get along. It was so funny. We were there with a couple of our kids and we got near the floor and all of a sudden she dropped to the floor because she was dizzy and could not handle standing on that glass floor. But there are times, aren't there, where we, we seem like this is going to be awesome. We can run towards this. It's going to be great. And then as we're going towards it, we're like, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. This is not what I expected. Now, here's the thing. It can be easy. It can be easy to embrace things when we think it's going to be easy. It's going to be beneficial. It's going to be awesome. We're going to love it. It's a different story, though, when it's not so easy. When what we need to run towards or move towards is not as easy as we'd think it'd be. And the same can be true when it comes to our attempts to be more like Jesus. 
See, it's easy to love like Jesus when what is asked for, when what he's calling us to do is something that we want to do. It's something that uh, we see in a similar fashion to the way God is pointing us. Or we know that we're going to feel fulfilled when we express our love in that way. Now, this could be something as simple as, you know, baking something for a bake sale when you love to bake and you're like, nailed it. And you've got that perfect cupcakes with the icing just right. And you love doing that. And so expressing love and and being able to bring something to a, a charity bake sale or something like that just seems like perfect. Love it. I can do that. No problem, God. I'm all on that. You know, I get to live out my, my inner chef or, you know, pastry chef type of, you know, ideas here. Or maybe it's singing in the choir or singing on stage at church when in your heart you have a secret desire to be in musicals. And so getting up on stage and being able to sing and, you know, do that is something that you don't mind doing because it it just speaks to something inside you that is like, oh, this is easy. This is awesome. I'd love to do that. And you just, you have no problem following God in serving and loving the community that way. Or maybe it's going on a missions trip when traveling and cultural experiences are something that you, you, you really enjoy. Be, being asked by God to go and do a missions trip, it's like, oh, fine, God, twist my arm. You know, bring me to a different location with, with a new cultural experience and in, in everything like that. And you, you're totally okay with God asking you to do those things and loving people that way. Or maybe it's serving with all your closest friends. You don't want to do any of that other stuff, but being with your group of friends that you're really tight with and hanging out with them and serving with them, it's like a party every single time you get together. And you're like, this is awesome. I love serving God because I'm just with all my friends and it's just beautiful all the time. And we just have such a great time. It's so blessed to be able to do this. It can be easy to serve God in those circumstances where, where it just seems like, We're flowing in the same direction as God. It's like getting into a lazy river of love with God and just being able to plunk in your inner tube and go along because where God's leading you is exactly where you wanted to go anyway. And it's just smooth sailing all the way. And none of these things are bad, right? It's not bad to be able to enjoy loving others and loving God in a way that brings fulfillment and brings enjoyment to your life. That's actually a a beautiful thing, right? They just, those things just come easy to us. And so it's easy to follow God in those. In following Jesus, though, you will have moments that are, that are a lot more like Jonah than like this. Let's read, let's read kind of a, the account of Jonah from Jonah 1, 1 to 3. And it says this, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Now that right there is probably enough for some of us to be like, yeah, the love train's over. I'm not, I don't feel like going and telling anybody that God's angry with them and that he's got something against them and that it's over. I don't, you know, we're, we're out already right there, right? But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Now Nineveh, it was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And that would be over in, if you're looking at your map of the Middle East, it'd be going, it'd be going uh, east from Israel towards Iraq. All right? And that's where Nineveh was. Um, and where, where Jonah was going to go, Tarshish, was 2,500 miles in the opposite direction. Right? So it's like 500 miles uh, to 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 Nineveh going west and, or going east, and then 2,500 miles going west by sea instead of across the land going to Tarshish. And in this day, that's, that's virtually like going to the other end of the earth, right? God said, go this way, and he's like, I can go that way, and that's as far as I know that exists almost. I'm going that direction. That's what Jonah was doing. And see, the Assyrians and the Assyrian Empire, of which Nineveh was the capital, they were oppressors of the Jewish people. The Assyrian Empire was ruling all over the Middle East at that time, and Israel was a vassal state of Assyria, meaning they paid tribute to Assyria at this time. 
Now you'd think maybe that Jonah, in the midst of what he was going through, in the midst of Israel being occupied and having to pay tribute to Assyria, that he'd be like, all right, let's go do this. You know, we could get rid of our, our overlords here and, and live free. You know, and maybe he's thinking God was going to wipe them off the face of the earth and it'd be awesome. But it seems that in, in reality, though, Jonah ran. And why did he run? Why did he go the other way? Why did he go the opposite direction? You, you think maybe it was because he was like, if I go and try to deliver this message, they're just going to kill me. Here I am. This, this prophet from Israel, come to the capital city of our oppressors, of our overlords, and I'm going I'm to walk into the city and tell them that God's angry with them and that they're all going to be in trouble. That's not going to go very well for me, is it now? And you think maybe that he ran because of fear, that he didn't want to be any a part of this plan that God had. But let's look at what really was going on in his heart. In Jonah 4, 2, it says this, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Jonah ran, not because he was afraid of Assyria and afraid of Nineveh and afraid of what they might do to him. Jonah ran because he knew God's love and that he would relent. God would relent if Nineveh repented. And so he fleed and went in the opposite direction because he didn't want God's love to conquer over his hate. He didn't want what God could potentially do for Nineveh and for Assyria to happen. He didn't want to be any part of God's love for them. Sometimes, sometimes when we run, and when we run from God's love, it looks like Jonah. When he calls you to love someone you hate. Now, it might not be a person that you hate and you think, well, I'm, I'm safe, I'm good, because I don't, I don't hate anybody. I'm, I'm good. I don't, I don't have any emotions that are that strong towards anyone. Maybe you are here and you, you definitely are like, yeah, there's some people that I'm holding a grudge against and they've done some pretty bad things to me. It might not be the person. It may be their politics that you hate. Maybe their worldview. Maybe their values or even their behavior that just like gets you and just, you know, puts you at odds with them. Maybe though, it may be a simple just as someone who has offended you. Someone who, is, who has spoken something into your life or done something even unknowingly towards you that has offended you and now you just have this animosity and this, this seeds of bitterness have, have like taken root in your heart towards them and loving them is the exact opposite of what you want to do. Extending them grace and mercy and kindness and looking after their best interest, you're like, no, that's not the way, God. I don't want to. I can't. There's, they, they don't deserve that, God. What they did to me, I need to, like, that's, somebody else needs to do that because, like, you can't ask that of me, God. See, Jonah, Jonah was a prophet, which meant he was to deliver the word of God. That was, that was his role. That was the, it, not like a spiritual gift that we have now as far as when we talk about prophecy. This was like an office of a prophet, the role of a prophet designated for the people to be the voice of God speaking to them as, as the Holy Spirit hadn't been released on all uh, mankind or on all, all followers of Jesus at the time. But Jonah was a prophet, meaning he was to deliver the word of God. God spoke to him and he spoke it to people. And Jonah did what we often do. He changed the rules of the game. He changed the, the goal line, if you, if you like sports analogies, uh, of how to be successful in the sea. Jonah went from delivering the word given to deciding if the word given was right to deliver. His role was just to say, okay, God, I hear, I hear your word for Nineveh. Now I'll go and deliver it. But he chose in that moment to say, okay, you gave me this word, God. I got to figure out whether or not that word is appropriate for Nineveh to receive. And we often do that too, don't we? God gives us something. He lays something on our heart. 
And then we decide, we try to figure out whether or not what God is asking of us is something that actually should be delivered on. Instead of just being the vessel that God would show grace to Nineveh through, even though it was a harsh message, Jonah decided that they didn't deserve the opportunity of grace. Now, in our culture today, editing a message of tough love or truth in love may feel like love. Trying to water it down or or cut it out or cancel it or whatever can sound a lot more loving, a lot more... Uh, It could be applauded as love from our culture, as tolerance and respecting other people's freedoms of choice. But is that actually a saving love or is that a self-serving love? If there's a truth that we know we need to stand for, if there's a way that God has asked us to walk and yet we choose to water that down or neutralize it in order to maybe not sound as harsh to Uh, the Nineveh that we need to speak to, is that a saving love or is that a self-serving love? Is that going where God wants us to or is that running to Tarshish? How do we, how did we get to decide the path that God's love chooses? Who are we to decide how and when and where God demonstrates his love? And see, one thing that makes uh, this mistake possible is when we lose sight of how we see an incomplete picture. See, Jonah was looking at Nineveh and looking at Assyria, and he was, he was making a judgment call based off of his perspective. And yet, he wasn't trusting that God's perspective was so much bigger and richer and deeper, and he could see from every angle what was going on and what he wanted to accomplish. And isn't that true for us today? Our limited perspectives, we use them to to discern and and decide whether or not we're actually going to follow what God has asked us to do. Thinking that we see clearly the picture in front of, well, I I can't can't step into that situation. I don't understand why God would ask me to do that because he knows that I am incapable of this or that or, or extending love or grace in that way because of who they are, what they've done, what they stand for. I'm just, I can't. And God should know that. So I'm, I'm off the hook from going in that direction. Our limited perspectives often lead to death and not life. Lead to separation instead of unity. Lead to a breakdown of love instead of embracing love. And now, maybe you're, you're, you're listening this morning, you're watching this morning and hearing this, and you're, you want to gang up on Jonah uh, and not to see ourselves as Jonah in this. And that's so dangerous for us to do because more often than not, in, in the story, in the account that we're reading in the Bible, it's the heel or the stubborn person. It's, it's the person in that position that we're supposed to be connecting with we're supposed to be identifying with. You see, in this story, God's love isn't just for Nineveh. He also loves Jonah. He also is trying to, to express his love and show Jonah a new way of living and a different way of moving. Just as much as he loves the 120,000 people living in Nineveh, He loves Jonah. Even if it seems like his love looks a little different than what Jonah would expect or feel like God should love. You see, in this story, God's love for Jonah and Nineveh looks like this. It looks like a word coming to Jonah again and again and again about Nineveh, right? A word that Jonah didn't like, but God wanted Jonah as a part of his plan of grace. Sometimes we get words from God and God's asking us of, for things that we don't like. But God wants us to be a part of his plan of grace. In this story, God's love looked like sending a storm and then a big fish to rescue him. And the reality is that our running from obeying God's call to love has consequences. 
It may not be as immediate as what Jonah faced, as getting in the boat and a storm coming and then him asking the, 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 the rest of the people on the boat to throw him overboard. Uh, you know, like that was going to, to uh, save everything. And then, and then God providing a fish that swallowed him and then spat him up on, on the shore. Like God's love came in, in crazy ways for Jonah in that situation. But part of his love is expressed only because of the consequences of Jonah's actions, of running the opposite direction that he should have gone. And then God grows a plant to shade him, and, and he appoints uh, a worm to eat this plant. And you see this, this scenario where God is trying to teach a petulant Jonah, this, this prophet who's sitting there grumpily watching Nineveh and waiting for it to be destroyed, and God is providing shade for him. And then he has that shade disappear so he can, he can give, Moses, or give Jonah this metaphor of God providing and taking away without Jonah having anything to do with it, and Jonah caring about this plant so much and then being angry that it got cut down. And he, he goes through this whole metaphor to try and reason with Jonah why he's trying to save Nineveh. It looks like God doing for Nineveh the opposite of what Jonah believed they deserved. The irony of this is that Assyria was being used by God at this time to discipline Israel for the very acts that they had in disobedience to God. Here here he is thinking that Assyria should be punished hard because they have overtaken Israel. And yet Assyria was God's God's instrument of discipline, of correction in the life of Israel. For Israel doing the exact same thing that Assyria was doing. Evil in the sight of God. At the end of this little book, this four chapter book of Jonah, we see the heart of God and why he sent Jonah to Nineveh. Jonah 4.11 says, and should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle. I guess God really likes livestock, but uh, there's a city full of 120,000 people. And that saying, they don't know their right hand from their left hand. I, I didn't even know. I looked at my left hand instead of my right hand first. So it just goes to show we we don't always know as much as we think we do, do we? But God looks at the city and he sees how lost they are. Yes, they are completely evil and immoral and, and doing deplorable things in his eyes. But he also sees the fact that they are lost. They don't know where they're going. They don't know which way to turn. And they need somebody to tell them which way to turn. A city who didn't know God discovers God and repents. Now, as a sidebar here, this is not in, the, not in the notes in the script at all, but did you know that in Cornwall and in the surrounding area of, of the counties and, and regions around it, that there is approximately 120,000 people? Pretty crazy. Now, this morning, I'm not talking about any special... Uh, uh, prophetic word or anything like that. But as I was just praying and driving in over the city, uh, Pastor Ingrid and I saw a little rainbow that was directly over like the direction of Cornwall as we were coming in. And this morning, as we were driving in, I was like, it's a sign. And we were, we were like just having a, a, a fun moment. But God spoke to me just in that moment about Cornwall. Uh, and again, not as necessarily an overly prophetic moment, but a moment of his promise. Because that rainbow represented a promise that God wouldn't destroy the earth anymore. And, in, and as I was contemplating this story about Nineveh and how God was saying to Jonah, go to Nineveh and tell them that the, the evil in his, in, that they've done in his eyes, is, is, it's over for them. And I just felt God saying with this rainbow and with this message that we're talking about and loving when, when it seems hard to love, that God was saying, like, For Cornwall, I want Cornwall to know how much I love them. And I need people to go into Cornwall, into that area, and tell them how much I love them 
So that the ways that they're going, the fact that they don't know their right hand from their left hand, the 120,000 people in this area can have a chance to go from not knowing God to turning to God, repenting and following him. So I just want to encourage us today, there's 120,000 people in our area that God says don't know their right hand from their left hand, that he wants them to come and turn to him. And we have a choice to how we want to respond to that. Now back into our message. A prophet who should know God runs from God. And yet God's love continues to pursue its purpose for both Jonah and saving Nineveh. So the question I have for you today is this. When have you been tempted to run from God? In what ways does God get your attention when you run from him. It may not be a storm. I'm, I'm, I feel pretty confident that it's not a giant fish swallowing you. Even though we don't know what's in, in the St. Lawrence Seaway there, what big creatures are swimming around in there, I'm pretty sure that's not what it is. But you know, in your heart, when God is speaking to you and saying, this is what I need you to do, and you run the other way, you know, you know the ways God tries to get your attention, to realign you back with his will, with his love. But no matter where we fail, like Jonah, Jesus is always faithful. Jesus is always right on the mark. See, hundreds of years later, after this account of of Jonah, Jesus says the same thing about uh, Israel, about the people of Israel in general, who, like Jonah, have gotten things a little backwards. They too, as a people, have moved from delivering the word given to deciding if that word is right to deliver. See, way back in Leviticus, God's word was given to his people, right? About how to live, how to love, how to move forward. In Leviticus 19.18, it says this, you shall not Take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord, putting his stamp on it. But somehow, some way, over time, they had taken that, that edict, that principle that God had given them, and they had turned it into something else. They had turned it into love your, enemy, or love your neighbor, hate your enemy. That's, that's how we do this. We love our, 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 our neighbor and we hate our enemy. And, and we have dis, dis, despise for those uh, against us and those who aren't, aren't for us. Now, remember how we, we've talked in previous, a previous week about the extras that we add in to, to God's rules. Remember, we, we talked about the scenario of the chair and how we don't want to sit in the chair and we make rules to not come near the chair and then not come near the room that the chair is in, not come near the house that the room is in in order to not break God's rules. And we, we add things and we manipulate things and we change things uh, and we change it to be more like what we think it should be than what God intended. And that's exactly what had happened in this, in this time frame. Love your neighbor turned into love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And that was never a part of it, to hate your enemy. And Jesus says this in Matthew 5. He says, you've heard it said, uh, that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. Being a part of God's family takes loving like God. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Once again, everywhere that Jonah fails, Jesus is faithful. Where Jonah failed to live out the fact that God was loving an enemy of Israel, that God was loving an enemy of this this covenant nation that God had a relationship with. God was still loving that enemy. Jonah failed in seeing that and living that out. And yet Jesus comes to rewrite that and, and say, no, you've heard it said, but I say to you, this is the way it should be. Jesus is faithful. 
He's faithful in forgiving. He's faithful in loving, faithful in restoring, and also in clearly sharing God's heart for whoever is lost and wishes to come home to him. In the story of Jonah, we see running from God in a literal way of of seeing something and then turning and going in the exact opposite direction. But in a parable that Jesus told, we see running from God in a different way. And this is our New Testament scenario that we work through. In Matthew 25, Jesus tells the parable of talents. And for some, it could be more terrifying than the story of Jonah. See, according to Jesus, running from God can look like Jonah, going the opposite direction, but it also can look like this in Matthew 25. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. So we're talking about the parable of the talents here. And then it jumps down. If we jump down farther, that's in verse 18. If we jump down to 24, it says this. He also who had received the one talent came forward. And what's happening is the master who had given the talents, the the 10 and the 5 and the 1, to his different servants was now coming back to see what they had done with those talents. And he had already reconciled with the 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 servant who had 10 and the servant who had 5. And now he's gone to the servant who had 1. And so the servant came forward and he says this, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own interest, what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. See, in this story, Jesus says running from him doesn't have to look exactly like Jonah. It certainly can, but it can also look like this. It can look like doing nothing with what we have received from God. Doing nothing with what we have received from God. See, the servant, he hid his master's money. It wasn't his money. It was his master's money. And he hid it and did nothing with it. Sometimes... Running from God can be as simple as that, burying, burying what God has given us, the talent that God has given us. It could look like this, following Jesus from an unhealthy fear. All right, what did the, what did the, the servant say? So I was afraid, All right? He was afraid of his master. And sometimes running from God is where we, we, we take on this perspective and we choose to take on this perspective of, of being, needing to be afraid of God. And so we're afraid of what we, we should do. And so we don't do anything or we run away from what we should do because for some reason we think we need to be afraid of God. And the third thing, maybe it's rooting in an unbiblical view as God is Father. We take this as when, when, when the servant says, you know, or he says, I, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you do not sow and gathering where you have not planted seed. All right? That view of God is just not a, a biblical view of God, of who God is and how he works, that he's this hard man and he's, he's, he's ruthless in how he gathers things and stuff like that. That's just not a biblical view of God. So running from God could be that, doing nothing, living in fear of God or having this view of God that, that is just not, doesn't align with Scripture. And so it, it, it plays with what we think. And, and we choosing to do that because he chose to think of his master as this way when the other servants didn't think that. In the story of Jonah, God is uh, demonstrably present with Jonah and he uses the life of Jonah. Um, he uses his life as part of what he's working through, right? You see him there in the storm, in the, in the whale, uh, spitting him up, uh, providing a plant and everything like you see him there. But in this story, in this parable, 
There's no storm. There's no great fish. There's just calm. There's just quiet. The master gave talent and then the master went away until the master returns. See, at times we are tempted, we are tempted to ignore God, hoping that whatever he plans and whatever his purposes were will just kind of go away and we can just we can just forget about them. We can put them off. But just because it goes quiet, it doesn't mean that God has gone away. It doesn't mean what God has said has gone away. Just because he doesn't bring storms and fish and plants and worms doesn't mean he is absent and indifferent or maybe even condoning of our running away from what he has asked us to do. Uh, for those of you who have been parents uh, or are parents and have small kids now, how many times have you potentially asked your child to do something and they were like, no, I'm not doing it. And you asked them again to do it and they're like, no, I'm not doing it. And then they, you ask them again and, and in your patience and in your perseverance, you just like kind of patiently allow them to have their little tantrum and their whatever when they're not wanting to do what you want them to do. And then it seems like something switches in them and they come back and they're like, hey, can I go and like, you know, go on a screen and watch TV? And you're looking at them like, did, did, you, did you do the thing that I asked you to do? Did you clean your room like I asked you to do? And you're like, you, you're like did you forget the last thing we just talked about? And, and they're just looking at you like, wait, what? How many times do we do that with God? Where God gives us direction. He gives us correction or asks us to do something. We don't want to do it. And so we just kind of like skip away from God and kind of do our own thing. And then when, when we, the emotions of what God asked us to do kind of subside a little bit, we come back to God and we're like, God, so can we do this? And God's looking at us like, do you remember what I asked you to do? You, you haven't gone there. How can, we, how can we move forward when you haven't done the last thing that I asked you to do? In the story of Jonah, God loves Nineveh and he uses the life of Jonah to deliver his message. In the parable of the talents, God loves others so much that he will take assignments from those being unfaithful by doing nothing and give them to those being faithful. That's tough. That's harsh. That's like I said, this is a scarier story of running away from God's love than the Jonah account. This one is different in that God takes away from the one who ran this time. So stories like Jonah and the parable of the talents should give us a holy pause to ask a couple of questions. Like Jonah, when have you been tempted to run from God? When have you been tempted to go in the opposite direction? Not because you're afraid necessarily of, of what could happen, but you see what God wants and the love of God and how the love of God wants to move forward, and you're just not in agreement with it. When has God asked, you, asked of you, um, or sorry, maybe what has God asked of you that didn't match up how you wanted to love others? We should also ask a question like this. Like in the parables, when have you been tempted to do nothing with what God has entrusted to you? When have you been tempted to do nothing with what God has entrusted to you? How maybe have you tried to justify not using your time, your treasure, or your talent for God's kingdom? Or you've come up with excuses or reasons why, well, you know, I would, I would, you know, really consider tithing as, as, a, as an obedient step towards God. But, you know, there's some other things that I really want to allocate some money towards. And, and I really want to do these things instead. And I, when I'm in a better position, maybe I'll look at that. Or... You know, my time, I've got so much time on my hands, I can only do certain things. So, like, there can be so many ways that we justify not, not doing what God is asking. Again, this isn't about earning anything and working towards uh, favor with God and doing more things so God sees you and says, great job. But instead, it's responding to what God is asking you to do and use your time, your talent, and your treasures for his kingdom when he asks you to do something. And you come up with reasons not to do those things. 
How have you tried to justify your time, treasure, and talent not being used for his kingdom? See, we can't be thrown by the sometimes smallness of what God is looking for. Jerry Sitzer uh, says this. He said, God uses common people to make history. The power of society often uh, forms a background in which the little people, the faithful people, honor God and transform the world. God loves to use the unassuming, unimportant people in the world. He only requires us to say with Mary, let it be to me according to your word. God isn't looking for you to be the hero. He's not looking for you to have to stand up on a grand stage and save the world. He's already taken care of that. What he's looking for is people who will walk with him and say, listen, there's Jesus. He is the savior of the world. You just need to know that. So what do we do with this? What are our next steps? How do we walk out loving more like Jesus in this way? First thing is this, root your view of God in scripture. Root your view of God in scripture. Don't let yourself have a a misaligned or unbiblical view of who God is. Let scripture, let God's word define God, not your experiences, not the world around you. The second thing, follow Jesus to flourish. Follow Jesus to flourish. When we try and say, like we've talked about like last week, staying in step with the Spirit, or two weeks ago, staying in step with the Spirit and walking in step with Him, the more we try to follow Jesus and walk with Him, we are going to flourish. So follow Jesus to flourish. Number three, do something for God's kingdom with your natural abilities, acquired skills, and spiritual gifts. Actually do something. Go to God and say, Jesus, how can I follow you and use my natural gifts, my natural abilities, the the skills I've acquired and the spiritual gifts you give me? How can I use them to advance your kingdom? And then do it. Just do something. Number four, live in the love of God so that the love of God can overflow through your life. In order to let God's love that he has for humanity be expressed through us, we really need to embrace that love ourselves and allow his love to transform us so that it's not our love that we we have to bring out to people. It's not our love. It's not something we manufacture in and of ourselves that becomes this love that we share with sometimes people that on the surface it looks like we should hate, people who have oppressed us, people who have hurt us, people who have offended us. And when we need to turn to them and love them and not despise them or feel hurt by them or push them away, it's not our love that rises in that moment. It's God's love because we have fully embraced his love for us. Root yourself in God's view of scripture. Follow Jesus to flourish. Do something for God's kingdom with your your talents and live in the love of God. Today, as we close, we're just gonna, we're gonna have our, our Cornwall worship team sing a song just to help us again reflect on who God is and, and our love for him and his love for us because that's where we want to be. We want to be right where Jesus is. So let's pray before our worship team uh, leads us and then Pastor Ingrid comes to close the service. God, today before you, we just pray this simple prayer. Not my word, but your word, God. Not my way, but your way, God. Not my life, but your life lived through me, God. Not my love, but your great love. May we love more like you, Jesus. Pray this in your name. Amen.